I think it's time for us to begin. So uh, our assignment for today is to our was to finish Bleak House. And the particular section that we agreed that we would focus on is chapters 50 to 67, which is the last one quarter of the novel. And I just want to remind you of something that I, I've said before, which is that uh, by the time that Dickens was writing Bleak House, he had established a, a, a kind of structure that he liked to use for his novels. And the novels divided roughly into four equal parts. The first five monthly numbers, the second five monthly numbers, the third five monthly numbers, and then the last five monthly numbers. The, the final number being a double number so that you paid two shillings for that and you got uh, a, double, a double number. So uh, numbers 19 and 20 uh, came, came together. So it's 20 parts in 19 uh, 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 installments. And three quarters of the way through the novel, but the assignment that we had for our last meeting, which was in November, oh, so long ago, um, was to read through chapter, uh, what was it, chapter 49. And uh, monthly number 15 is therefore three quarters of the way through the novel. And that is a particularly important monthly number as, as several of you pointed out. Uh, it contains the chapter called Joe's Will in which Joe dies, Joe, a character whom uh, we've grown very attached to and whose uh, uh, vulnerability has been uh, uh, made very aware to us. In uh, the next chapter, closing in, Mr. Talkinghorn, uh, one of the principal bad guys of the novel, is killed. And uh, so we have the beginning Notice how late it is in the novel that we have a murder mystery, a detective, a classic detective story event that occurs. So the death of Joe, the death of Mr. Tulkinghorn, and then the third chapter in that wonderful monthly number uh, is called The Old Girl's Birthday. And the old girl's birthday, you, one way that you can think about that monthly number is that it has two, uh, two chapters that are devoted to what we might think of as main plot elements, serious plot elements in, in the book. Uh, the death of Joe with all the implications of his death and the narrator's accusation or uh, uh, statement to my lords and ladies. Um, then the death of talking horn. And then we have a comic chapter and, and it's the, devoted to the old girl's birthday, but it's not entirely irrelevant to what has preceded it because at the end of the old girl's birthday, uh, which is a celebration of Mrs. Bagnet with the Bagnet, the wonderful Bagnet family, um, they have a visitor and the visitor is Mr. Bucket. And uh, one of the guests at the old girl's birthday party is Mr. George. And at the end of the old girl's birthday, uh, Bucket, Detective Bucket, arrests Mr. George for the murder of Talking Horn. Um, so uh, if, Im imagine that you are reading this novel or that you read this novel in its original monthly installments. And what would you think to see Mr. Bucket arrest George, one of, one of the characters whom we have grown particularly fond of, I think, for committing this murder. So you're left for at least a month in suspense as to whether uh, George is the, uh, the murderer or whether it is someone else. Probably someone else you like to think because George doesn't seem like a murderer, um, but why has Bucket, the great detective Bucket, arrested George? Um, is, does he have some other plan in mind in arresting George? Um, um, and if George didn't do it, who did it? So 
um, we're, we're left with that. And one of the things that will happen in the concluding section of the, of the novel, which we, by now we have all finished, of course, is that Bucket will solve the murder mystery plot and it will turn out that it was Hortense who committed the murder. So the place that I wanna begin is actually, and I'll, I'll ask Courtney to show the, the first illustration uh, that I, I asked her to, to prepare. And it's, a, um, it's the illustration that is called Another Meaning in the Roman. And uh, you, you will remember this. Um, uh, it's the uh, room in which the murder has taken place. It's an empty room, one of the many rooms in Bleak House that is loaded with significance. But this, this is interesting to us and interesting to me in particular because of it depicts the ceiling of that room. And there's the figure of the Roman uh, who is pointing and he's pointing to a spot on the floor which is right in front, you can see right in front of the chair uh, to the right, the one that has the light shining on it. And there's a, a black spot on the floor, um, black, dark. Um, uh, we know that it's red. And that's the spot at which the Roman is pointing. And it's the stain of blood on the floor that marks the, um, the death of, of Talking Horn. But what I'm especially interested in doing is talking about the Roman. And the Roman is referred to most often in the novel as allegory. So my opening question to all of you is what is an allegory and in what ways might Bleak House be understood as an allegory? So what, what, what's an allegory? And I'll, I'll ask people to raise their hands and Courtney, if you can help me, I, I don't, uh, at this point, I can't see uh, the participants. So we don't need to keep the illustration up any, any longer for, for right now. So, so what's an allegory and how is Bleak House, how might Bleak House be thought of as an allegory. Oh, it's Mike. I don't have my Wellick and Warren in front of me, but uh, you know, an, al an allegory is a story told in veiled terms, where one layer of it is purely symbolic and refers to a more basic and underlying story. Okay, and it's often uh, th that's a good definition. It's it's a story, and it's I think it's important to think of it as a story. Um, uh, an allegory is, is a story uh, and it has a literal meaning and then it has a figurative or we might say a metaphorical meaning at, a, at, at another level, which is um, perhaps the moral of the story or uh, uh, at least another layer of meaning, which is very important. So in what ways then might Bleak House be considered an allegory? I'm, and I'm talking now about the novel as a whole. So, Brad. Well, hello, by the way. Um, you know, an allegory is an allegory in terms of a story is, <clears throat> is I think one story being told in the guise of another. Um, that, and, that sounds good and to me. you know, that's, that's kind of expansive um, in a way, because I actually suspect I personally suspect there are many things being spoken of here in one guise, but referring to another. Um, 
but and many things being held up into light um, through the use of these disguises. Um, you know, we've spoken about many of them, but but certainly, certainly, honesty and authenticity seems to me to be perhaps one of the more prevalent themes. I guess that's that's what I would say. Okay. Um, anyone else want to suggest ways? Yeah, hi. hi, I'd like to. Yes. Uh, and I, it just occurred to me that if you follow Esther's character and her experience through the whole novel, just a straight line, um, that seems pretty allegorical to me. It's very um, black and white, I feel, that there's, I don't feel the subtlety, any subtlety in Esther's character. So that's why I say it's, she's kind of like an allegorical, like a moral uh, token. And so I don't know if that's <laughs> has anything to do with your question, but um, I just noticed that for myself. Okay. Um, the, the moral, the allegory here would be that Esther is a figure of goodness. And the story is allegorical in that it's a demonstration of how a good person under difficult circumstances can survive and achieve happiness. That would be a, a, a way to read the story allegorically as a simple story of, of good and bad. Um, beautiful, beautiful explanation. <laughs> um, let, me, let me propose an, a, another uh, way of thinking about allegory. Um, if, if we think about who inside the novel tells a story that is itself an allegorical story or that might be thought of as an allegorical story. There are two stories that I can think of. There may be more. One is the story that Mr. Tulkinghorn tells to Sir Lester and Lady Dedlock um, after he has figured out all the secrets that he has been searching for. And he tells a story about a hypothetical situation in which a lady of high birth uh, had an illegitimate child and uh, the information that he that comes out about that story is destructive to other people in the story. And this is Talkinghorn's way of notifying Lady Dedlock that he has all the information about her. It's part of his strategy of blackmail. Tulkinghorn is a blackmailer. Um, so Tulkinghorn tells a story, which is an allegory. He tells one story, but its meaning is in other terms. And then there's another story that gets told uh, early, earlier in the novel. And it's the story that is told by Mrs. Rouncewell when Guppy comes to take a tour of Chesney Wool. And Mrs. Rouncewell tells the story of the ghost at Chesney Wool, the ghost story. And it's a story about that ghost that haunts Chesney Wool. And it's a story that goes back to the Civil War in England and the um, uh, struggle that took place in England in the 17th century uh, between the royalists and the forces of parliament. And it was a, um, a, 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 an internal civil war. And the Lady Dedlock of that period was a sympathizer to the forces of parliament. And her husband was a royalist. And she, uh, in an effort to favor the parliamentarians, uh, went into the stables and deliberately lamed the horses there so that the royalist forces could not have access to that. 
And in doing that, she was lamed, a horse kicked her. And from that point on, so Mrs. Rouncewell says, a ghost walks on the, uh, the outside of Chesney Wold. And the signal in the novel for that is drip, drip, drip. <laughs> um, and it, it echoes through the, the novel. Now that's a story that could be read allegorically. It's a story about the past, but it may also be a story about the present. So one way of thinking about Bleak House, I suggest, particularly in relation to that second story, Mrs. Rouncewell, is that it's a story about revolution, about the attempt of one group to overthrow the, uh, the structures, the existing structures of power and dominance in England, the monarchy, uh, the royalists. And that's something that actually, I think, has reference through the whole of Bleak House. Bleak House, in part, this does not exhaust the novel uh, by any means, but Bleak House is a political allegory. So how is Bleak House a political allegory? That's, that's my question. It, this is not the only way to read the story, but uh, um, so. William has a question about uh, Talking Horn. I'm, I'm gonna come back to Talking Horn and, uh, and blackmail in just a minute. So, David. In some ways, I think it's possible to read the, the book as a representation of the state of England. Dickens shows us people of all different sorts. Joe is almost an allegorical figure but Joe represents, Joe puts a face on the faceless poor. Sir Lester is representative of the, not terribly bright, but uh, powerful uh, minor nobility. Uh, I haven't thought this through all the way, but I think, of course, we've got the Iron Master. Okay. George's brother. And, but in a way, it's, it's Dickens telling a story that is a portrait of England. Okay, that, that's a good start. You, you've given us some cues. So, so Robert, uh, why, don't, why don't you pursue this? <clears throat> Yes, I was, I was going to bring on the topic of uh, the Iron Master. Uh, he represents a man who uh, built himself up from humble beginnings and, and um, <clears throat> accomplished this huge empire, uh, many factories and, and lots of employees. Uh, but he was not respected by Sir Lester, uh, who was the old school. So they are uh, polar opposites of the political uh, spectrum. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the Iron Master always showed uh, deference to um, Sir Lester. He was never disrespectful, but he never backed down either. So they uh, showed two opposing sides of uh, the, the politics. Some, some were like, you're, you're born into the leadership uh, position and uh, the other one was you, you earned your way to the, the leadership uh, position. But uh, Lester's character did change after his wife died. Uh, he became a little more sympathetic too. So I think uh, <clears throat> uh, Dickens is showing that there's a possibility of people changing. Um, nobody expected him to uh, forgive his wife. They all thought that uh, she would be uh, divorced and dishonored. Uh, but uh, he was, he did, his character did change at the very end. So okay. I think he's showing that, that the royals can change. Okay. Um, 
uh, what happens to Sir Lester at the end of the book is, I agree, very, very interesting. And uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So um, Mike Stern and then Glenna. Um, yeah, I'd put a finer point on it. I mean, Chesney Wold and its decrepitude, it's about the sclerotic failure of the aristocracy, um, which still runs England. And remember, you know, Coodle Boodle and, and Noodle, um, and about the sclerotic decay of uh, Parliament and about the sclerotic dec decay of Chancery, all the major institutions of, uh, uh, you know, of English as a political society and as a nation are rotten, corroded, ineffectual, sclerotic. Um, and you know that if, you know that that's the you know you know Dickens as a reformer um, caught up in the midst of the battle over the the uh, expanding the suffrage um, just about the time the novel was written uh, <clears throat> is uh, it, it's a it's a death of the old order novel right and the old order quite literally dies in front of us. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. That's very good. I, I'll, I'll comment on that in just a second. But, um, uh, Glenna. Well, <clears throat> Mike kind of uh, stole my thunder because I was going to bring up boodle and foodle, etc. <laughs> the utter incapacity of the existing institutions to grapple with the horrible situations, which Joe demonstrates. I mean, you have people dying of, of want and almost literally in the streets and uh, and you have this nonsensical political structure that is doing absolutely nothing to address the real problems. Okay, um, let me- Sounds sweeter, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I missed that, what? Going to seven sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. <laughs> about the fifth year of this Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, what what the last several people have said is entirely correct. I mean, this this is a novel which whose political allegory refers to the contemporary period in England. It's what is sometimes called a condition of England novel. Uh, that's. Uh, a, a reference to a phrase that uh, Carlyle Carlyle used, Dickens's friend uh, uh, and very influential friend, uh, Thomas Carlyle, talked about the condition of England problem. And the condition of England problem is that the 1840s, the period leading up to, you know, immediately before um, uh, the time when Bleak House is written, were a time where it seemed as if England was on the threshold of a revolution, a social revolution, a chartist movement, a working class movement um, that looked back to the past, that looked back to the English Civil War uh, as, a, as a precedent and as, uh, as something that authorized their struggle for the franchise. Um, and it's, it's perhaps useful to think of, uh, uh, of two different kinds of allegories. One is the social allegory in which there are uh, social problems of which Joe is, um, of which Joe and poverty uh, are the examples and a political allegory which pits uh, the old order with Sir Lester Dedlock and uh, the Iron Master as the new order. This is a struggle between the industrial middle class going to shut the door for my dog. That it's, it's a political struggle between the new industrial uh, middle class embodied in the, the figure of the Iron Master and the old aristocratic order, which is sclerotic, as, uh, as Mike says, um, uh, which is, and the name is is you know the obvious clue to that deadlock, um, and one of the ways in which Dickens is always uh, pointing toward allegorical readings, not just in this novel but in uh, in, in almost every novel, is uh, through his use of names. Um, and at some point, we should probably do a little digression and talk about the names in. Um, uh, in, in Bleak House, but Deadlock is sort of, is one major example of that. 
uh, the institutions, uh, the political structure, uh, the, uh, the church, the legal system, uh, all of these are in a position of deadlock where the great social problems of the age cannot be uh, constructively addressed. Um, and what's going on at the political level is a struggle for power. And there's a parliamentary election that takes place in the middle of the novel. Uh, it's in the chapter that's called National and Domestic. And uh, that, that, that chapter title points to the fact that there are parallels between what's happening at the domestic level, that is the plot of the individual lives and families in the novel, and the national. And um, so one question that I have, and I, I'm, I'm heading toward Mr. Tulkinghorn. Remember, I started with the, uh, with the image of the room where Tulkinghorn is, is murdered. Um, what is Tulkinghorn's position in relation to the social uh, and political conflict uh, that the novel is allegorizing? Tell me a little bit about Tulkinghorn. And uh, I saw Phyllis had a hand up. So Phyllis, do you want to speak? Hi, John. Um, actually, I put my hand down when you said Tulkinghorn okay. because I, okay. I, I, I'll talk about something else later. Sorry. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, where, do, where does Talking Horn fit into the social, political, and class structure of this novel? William. Talking Horn seems to be the loyal retainer of the old order. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, he's devoted to the honor of the Deadlock, Deadlock household. Uh, he's far more clever than uh, the family to which he is loyal. Uh, he's a type character that, is, that sort of supported the old order since the Middle Ages in England. Uh, in the Middle Ages, he would have been of a monk uh, or to be chancellor. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the figure he is. He is not, inter- he's not the new order. He's, he's helping to- He's not the, the new order. order. He's definitely not the new order. Um, in the power struggle between the that's embodied in the election, the uh, the Iron Master and Sir De- uh, Sir Lester, um, he's well. Where exactly is he? Because you're, I'm interested, William, in the first sentence you said that Talking Horn seems to be a figure of the old order. And it's that word seems that, that I want to push on uh, just a little bit. But uh, Nina, I, w- I want to give you a chance to, to speak. Um, yeah, actually, I was going to say sort of like the opposite. Like he seems like he is of the old order, but actually his success kind of hinges on like them messing up more. So actually, like his, his success is benefiting uh, like benefits from like the the missteps of the old order. So he's actually more like um, like George's brother or some somebody in that way. Where actually his like interests are in conflict with the aristocratic ones, although they like prop him up. So it's kind of a weird circle. I I thought. It, talking horn is hard to place. I mean, he's William is correct in saying that he seems to be an upholder of the existing order. But seems is is really the crux of this. And when the election takes place and Sir Lester asks Talkinghorn about the results of it, Talkinghorn says, you have lost. He does not say, we have lost. And that's, I think, a crucial indicator that uh, that Talkinghorn does not completely identify with the interests of the old order, that he holds himself a little bit apart. So now we need to ask what, and and I'm gonna focus more on Tulkinghorn, not so much immediately on the political, but what are Tulkinghorn's motives? I've I've said that Tulkinghorn uh, has a, um, uh, Tulkinghorn is, is engaged in a blackmail plot. But what is Tulkinghorn 
trying to achieve. We, ha we haven't really talked about a, a major plot element in this novel, which is the conflict, the emotional, psychological, uh, moral struggle that takes place between Talking Horn and Lady Dedlock. We haven't really talked much about Lady Dedlock either. So what is Talking Horn? We, we talked early in our conversation about the detectives in the novel. And we enumerated many detectives. We didn't at that point talk about uh, Inspector Bucket because Inspector Bucket had not yet appeared in the novel. Um, but we did talk about Talking Horn as an example of what I call the armchair detective as opposed to Guppy. Guppy is the active detecti detective who goes out and stumbles across uh, remarkable evidence, um, but can't figure out how to put it together. And Talking Horn is the armchair detective who doesn't spend much time going out and looking for evidence. Um, he uses other people to bring evidence to him. And he sits in his office and thinks about the issues intellectually. Um, but what is, what is Talking Horn's motive? What is Talking Horn doing? So um, yes, Frank, you're, you're first. There we go. He's a collector of secrets. Yes. He wants, I, I think he's like almost a political operative playing both sides for, for his own advantage. He, uh, he just, he can, he can call up all his records, all his papers that have secrets of the aristocracy. He can, he can call these things up at will and, and use them as he sees fit. Um, it's important to think of him as a collector of secrets. And as someone who possesses secrets, um, he can use that information for his own ends. But you said to, he works to his own advantage. What is the advantage that he seeks to gain by gaining possession of the secret of Lady Dedlock? What is he trying to get? Oh. I'm going to add, I'm going to go on to Robert, but thank you. You got to start it, Frank. Robert. <clears throat> uh, Talking Horn is first and foremost an opportunist. So I, th I think he's going to go with whichever side that benefits him. Um, and blackmailing uh, Lady Deadlock uh, achieves two things. I, we have, it doesn't specifically say, uh, Anything in the in the, uh, uh, in the in the novel, but we get the sense that that she might have rejected him or kind of uh, did some kind of social slight toward him, which or he held a grudge against her. So there's that that he has against her, but having control of her uh, gives her gives him more control over Sir Lester. Um, okay, uh, one possible motive is to for blackmail um, that mm -hmm. doesn't seem particularly to apply to Talking Horn is to blackmail for money, for financial gain. Talking Horn doesn't seem to be blackmailing to get money. Another might be to gain power over Sir Lester if, because Lady Dedlock as the much beloved wife of Sir Lester um, has influence over her husband. So by gaining power over um, Lady Dedlock, he might gain power over Sir Lester, but he already has a lot of power over, over Sir Lester. He, he knows all the family secrets. And um, so uh, what, I, I think we haven't gotten at the, at, the, at the heart of what motivates Talking Horn. So Glenna. Well, I think part of it is resentment. I think that he he hangs out. <clears throat> he hangs out with the aristocrats, but in some way, he is below the salt, and that he's constantly reminded of that. And I also wanted to say, apropos of the collector of secrets angle, it made me think. You know, this flashed in my mind. A book, I think it was Robert Caro's book on Robert Moses, talks about how, for some people, knowledge is power. 
-hmm. and uh, he doesn't have the capital of of uh, Roncesvalles, and he doesn't have the social position of Sir Leicester, but he has this incredible capacity for gaining and deploying knowledge. And so I think he's in part motivated by resentment and he uses what he has at hand. Because if he were really, he alleges that he's trying to protect the position of the deadlock family, but he's gonna break Sir Lester's heart. And if he cared a whit about Sir Lester as a human being, he would not be doing this. The really, um, thank you, many good things, and I think knowledge is power is a, is a key statement in understanding um, what Tulkinghorn is doing. But one of the most curious things about the, pl the blackmail pot plot uh, that Tulkinghorn is carrying out is that once he confronts Lady Dedlock, he tells her that he doesn't want her to change doing anything that she has been doing already. He wants no change in her behavior. And what ends the blackmail plot is that Lady Dedlock lets Rosa go. Rosa, the daughter substitute, um, and Rosa uh, is engaged to be married to uh, a young man who's the son of uh, the Rouncewells, uh, who has the very interesting and perhaps allegorical name of Watt. Um, and there are two Watts uh, who should be referenced in that, that name. Uh, one of them is James Watt, who was the inventor, so it is said, of the steam engine. So he is identified very closely with the Industrial Revolution. And the other is a figure from British history named Watt Tyler, W-A-T. And Watt Tyler in the, I think it was the 14th century, was the leader of a peasant revolution against the king because the king had extracted <laughs> Uh, exorbitant taxes. So there's a figure of revolution, an allegorical figure from the past, not just the English Civil War from the 17th century, but from the 14th century as well, a, a figure of revolution. And revolution is part of the, um, the underlying uh, um, possibility of the struggle that's taking place between uh, Rouncewell and Sir Leicester, the industrial middle class uh, struggling for power, political power, social power with the aristocracy, but lower down, there's the possibility of a popular rebellion, a popular revolution that might originate with people like Joe, that might originate with people like Watt Tyler. And Sir Leicester is actually someone who reads what's happening in England allegorically, because he's constantly talking about the floodgates of society opening and the structure of society breaking down. And he's worried about Watt Tyler. He somewhat ludicrously thinks that the Iron Master uh, is an example of revolution. But I would argue that the Iron Master is not a revolutionary figure at all. The revolutionary figure in the novel is, do you have a name that you want to propose? It's Hortense. Hortense is uh, the French maid who actually, of course, turns out to be the murderer of Tulkinghorn and who is associated with the dangers of the French Revolution. So behind the political allegory about the struggle between the industrial middle class and the aristocracy is the threat of popular revolution that would indeed uh, loosen the floodgates of, of society. So, um, but I, I've digressed a little bit and I wanna come back and Mike has your hand up. Oh, right, uh, hold on, gotta unmute. Oh, um, yeah, two things. Um, uh, one is that, um, and lawyers are the shock troopers of capitalism. And, uh, um, it, you know, um, the law by 1850 was beginning to, um, to shift in the direction of stopping, no longer protecting aristocracy, especially their land rights and opening it up to industrial development. But um, to, I, I push back on the notion that Tolkien Horn has a motive. 
Um, it's not ressentiment in the French revolutionary sense as Hortense's is. Um, he, he's a Machiavelli. Um, to me, he's part of Dickens's Aegon with Shakespeare. Um, he's, he's Iago. He has no motive. That's the whole point. He, 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 he destroys for the sheer joy. He harbors secrets and manipulates people for the sheer joy of it. And he, 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 you know, if this was a Jacobean trage tragedy, he'd be Volpone. You know? <laughs> I mean, in the, and he strikes me as much more in that guise than as a character with a motive or a set of motives. Okay, it's always good to invoke Shakespeare when you're talking <clears throat> about Dickens, because Dickens is very conscious of Shakespearean models. And uh, um, so one possibility is that Tolkien Horn has no motive, uh, that he's the uh, Iago figure in this novel who enjoys doing evil things for the sake of doing evil things. Um, so um, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna take two more qu uh, questions and then I'm gonna tell you my uh, thinking about this. So Peggy. This is short. The person that came to mind to, for me was J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Another just, good analogy. But having I think having power for the sake of having power, if you don't feel like you're good enough yourself and you can do this, is a motive. Okay. That's um, as far as that power, one. Power, power. Denise. Hi. Um, well, first, thank you for letting me participate in the group. I'm thrilled about it to have discovered you, to have found you out. Um, I, I see Token Horn as a, a puppet controller um, bringing the image of the allegory in his ceiling with the finger pointing. I think he's always pointing his finger um, and trying to control people. And he has this component of a misogynist and he doesn't like women seemingly. And so uh, I think he, he was very excited when he found out Lady Deadlock's uh, weak spot so that he could control her, he could uh, do with her as he liked. Um, so I, I think this, his motive is, has a lot to do with controlling her, with power over her as a revenge against women in general. Um, that's a very good point, and I, I'm gonna. Uh, I know. I know that there are other people who have hands up, but I'm. I'm going to close off um, questions and and pursue uh, what Denise just uh, said about Talking Horns misogyny. And I think that Talking Horns, if if one place that we can enter into uh, understanding a motive for Talking Horn is to think about his attitude toward women. Um, at one point he says, uh, and I forget the exact context, but that people shouldn't marry, that all the problems of the world are the result of marriage. Uh, and that's part of his misogyny. It's, that's a way of saying that letting women into the world is, is going to create difficulty. So uh, Courtney, could you please show the, the second uh, 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 passage that, that I asked. And this is, this is my way of getting at the question or another way of getting at the question of allegory in the novel. So uh, um, uh, this is a passage from chapter 22 entitled Mr. Bucket and I'll simply read it. Mr. Tulkinghorn sits at one of the open windows enjoying a bottle of old port. Though a hard-grained man, close, dry, and silent, he can enjoy old wine with the best. He has a priceless bin of port in some artful cellar under the fields, which is one of his many secrets. When he dines alone in chambers, as he has dined today, and has his bit of fish and his steak or chicken brought in from the coffee house, he descends with a candle to the echoing regions below the deserted mansion and heralded by a remote reverberation of thundering doors, 
comes gravely back, encircled by an earthy atmosphere and carrying a bottle from which he pours a radiant nectar two score and ten years old that blushes in the glass to find itself so famous and fills the whole room with the fragrance of southern grapes. Now, I, I think this is a wonderful passage, and I think it's a key to what Talking Horn is about. And this is a passage that asks to be read allegorically. That is, I think that this is a reference to a well-known classical myth. It's part of why the uh, allegor the figure of allegory is called a Roman. And in this allegorical reading, Talking Horn is a figure of Hades or Pluto in the Roman mythology, who is the, the lord of the underworld. And we seldom have any access to, to Talking Horn's interior life. But this is a scene where we see him indulging himself in a certain form of pleasure. He likes his wine. And the description of him descending under the fields, remember the fields are a reference to Lincoln's Inn Fields, which is the area where the law offices are, are located. And he goes to, in search of a bottle of old port and comes back gravely encircled by an earthy atmosphere um, and uh, that blushes in the glass to find itself so famous and fills the whole room with the fragrance of Southern grapes. I propose that this tells us what Talking Horn's motive is. That Talking Horn likes to preserve secrets and savor them and use them to acquire power over women. He hates women. The misogyny is very strong in him. And he is the Lord of the underworld. And the bottle of port is a female figure. The, the myth is the myth of Persephone or Proserpine in the Roman mythology. And what he likes to do is to go down, bring that blushing bottle of wine, uh, that feminized bottle of wine up, and savor it and sip it. And I think that Talking Horn is the lord of the underworld who likes to torture women. He's a sadist. He's someone who enjoys torturing Lady Deadlock. He doesn't want her to change doing anything. He doesn't want to upset the aristocratic order in which he is, um, uh, from which he is benefiting uh, um, greatly because he's a privileged figure. But he also has some of that resentment, not quite the resentment, the ressentiment of the, of the, uh, of the lower classes, but Talking Horn is a form of servant. He's a servant in, he's a privileged servant. And what he wants from Lady Dedlock is the power to torture her, to bring her up, to sip her, to taste her. He's like, and we can refer back, I think, usefully to Dombey and Son, the novel, um, uh, two novels previously, where uh, Carker is the privileged servant, the, um, the manager in Mr. Dombey's establishment. And Carker really wants to possess Dombey's wife. And I think what Talking Horn wants is to possess Sir Lester's wife. Remember, she's the most beautiful woman or one of the most beautiful women in England. And one of the, the um, you know, the epitome of the fashionable world. And so one mythic allegory of uh, of, of this novel is the way in which Talking Horn looks for power over women and not in order to change the social order, but in order to have the power that comes with it, particularly the power over Lady Dedlock. So that's my reading of the motive. And it, it helps me to understand why 
Talking Horn doesn't want Lady Deadlock to change anything. And Lady Deadlock, the, 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 it's, it's a, I, I, I think of it as a, um, a game of emotional chess. And that metaphor, that's maybe even an, another allegory that, that structures the novel. Because um, early in the novel, Talking Horn is compared to a bird. He's compared to a bird because he lives, uh, his room at Chesney Wold is on the top floor and he often goes out and walks on the, um, the, the balustrade at the top of the house and he's compared to a larger species of rook. And a rook is of course a piece on the chessboard. And the, um, the chessboard of Bleak House is one in which we have a king, if you will, Sir Lester, who suffers from gout and who is immobile. And we have a queen, if you will, who is Lady Dedlock. And the queen in this instance is very mobile. She moves all over the board. She moves across the channel. She goes to Paris. She goes wherever she wants. And her mobility is in stark contrast to the immobility of Sir Lester. But another powerful figure on the chessboard is the rook. And what I think the rook in this case, Mr. Tulkinghorn wants to do is to capture the queen, not to take her and remove her from the board, but to keep her on the board and to keep her immobilized, uh, keep her under his power. She can move anywhere she wants, but he retains the power over her. And uh, Sir Lester, and and the, you could you know it's an it's an allegory that could be pursued even further. There are some um, minor characters who might be thought of as the pawns in this in this chess game. I, I I think Guppy lends himself particularly to being thought of as a pawn. Maybe even Esther is a pawn in this game. Although Esther Esther is more complicated than than um, when Bucket. Uh, goes with her in search of Lady Deadlock in the wonderful chase sequence that is part of the final uh, segment of, of this novel. He keeps, um, at, or at, at one point, or I think at two points, he, he calls her a queen. Um, and uh, Esther is, of course, the name of a queen in the Hebrew Bible. And so it's possible that Esther's role in the chess game allegory of this novel is to reach the other side of the board and become a queen. So that's one idea, one possibility that uh, I, I would suggest. So Victoria, I see you have your hand up. So I'll, 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 do you want to say something to this one? You're muted. How's this? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just can't wait because I'm sorry. It's the fog. You've got the fog at the very beginning and you've got Tolkenheim and the fog. And the other bit of fog is to do with the French Revolution, that at this historical time in England, many people were scared that England was going to have another revolution. Yes. And they were trying to cover over the possibility to protect themselves. And the other problem that there was in England was that we'd had a very high birth rate, that the youngsters hadn't died like they had over years before. So there were many, many young people underage hanging around. So you've got, from my perspective, you've got Dickens, who obviously is always concerned to keep his income coming in because of what happened to his family. You've got Dickens who has a fear of, of the fact that the uh, French Revolution may become the British one too. And you've got Tulkenheim who's pulling the fog over the eyes of Lady Dedlock. And the fog, the fog intertwines into the whole story and makes it even more beautiful. And then you add the fact that you have the most despicable number of people in the story who to try and cover their tracks with fog, but they show up larger than life. 
Okay, um, that introduces a whole series of, uh, of other motifs. And I, I think you're right. I mean, the fog is there at the beginning. Um, and uh, if, if we're gonna talk about motifs or um, symbols perhaps, or atmospheric effects that contribute to the allegorical significance of this novel, we have to talk about the fog. We also have to talk about disease because disease um, is disease is a central metaphor in the novel. And it's one of the motifs that Dickens is using. This is something that comes from, uh, from Carlyle, from, uh, from Carlyle's uh, um, Past and Present, which is a, an essay that he published in 1846, I think, um, but that Dickens was familiar with, that uh, the, um, there's a Scottish widow and uh, Carlyle, who's a carrier, who carries the disease of scarlet fever. And um, she infects other people and infection spreads from the lower classes to the upper classes. And that disease, that threat of a disease that is impersonal, we're all too familiar with this because of the pandemic, uh, shows no respect for class, for hierarchy, for wealth, uh, for political affiliation. And it's a way that Carlyle argues of proving that society is organic, that society is a whole, much as some people would like to keep it hierarchical and stratified and keep the the working class away from any form of contamination. And the fog is something similar, but the fog is pervasive everywhere. So fog and disease are both, I think, symbols or motifs that indicate that society is connected at, at every level. Um, but uh, uh, thank you for, for, for those suggestions. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna switch directions now, if, if, if I may. And um, I, I, I've, I don't think we've exhausted Talking Horn and, and Lady Dedlock. Um, we certainly haven't exhausted Hortense um, and uh, the, the threat of the French Revolution is very much uh, present at this time and it's associated with Chartism and the history of the English Civil War and of Watt Tyler. Um, uh, one question that one, I, I'm not gonna try and answer this question now, but I'll toss it out for you. Where does Dickens stand in terms of these various political uh, forces? Is Dickens a radical who's on the side of the working class? Is Dickens uh, someone who is himself uh, frightened by the threat of violent revolution? Is Dickens on the side of the Iron Master? If things change from uh, a, a ruling class that's vested in the aristocracy to a ruling class that's vested in industrial uh, uh, aristocracy, does that change anything for people at the bottom of society? Or is it just the same boss uh, in a different, different form? Um, it's industrial capitalism rather than uh, uh, aristocratic privilege. Um, you know, where, where does Dickens stand in, in all of this? But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try and answer that now. And I'm not going to, you know, we, we do have a, a, another session <laughs> um, next time. But right now, I, I want to switch to uh, something that I think is, is part of the most extraordinary uh, uh, pieces of, of Bleak House. And it's uh, the chase sequence that involves Bucket and Esther. Uh, uh, and you remember um, how, how this is introduced. I mean, Miss, Mr. Bucket, a couple of things to say about, about Mr. Bucket and Mr. Bucket's role in, um, in the novel, which I think is, is more complicated than, than many people have thought. Um, the detective police, Bucket is a detective. He's, uh, he's an, an inspector of the detective police. The police uh, are, are a relatively recent invention in Victorian England. They're called Bobbies because they were introduced by Sir Robert Peel in the 1840s. Um, and the detective police are a branch of 
the Metropolitan Police. And uh, Bucket is a detective policeman. And as a detective policeman, he's in a rather ambiguous situation that um, this novel, I think, very carefully demonstrates. As a detective, he is available to be hired on a private basis. So he is engaged by Tulkinghorn, for example, to find Joe, to bring Joe to try and help identify uh, who the lady, the veiled lady who uh, asked to be taken to the, to the graveyard. Um, so, so Bucket is, is what we would call a private detective. Um, but he's also a member of the Metropolitan Police because the, and that ambiguity, part private and part public, is, is part of, of, of his nature. So um, uh, is Mr. Bucket, and you know, we're, we're in an age where the status of the police is very much um, in question. Um, defund the police. What's the role of the police? Is Bucket, you know, I'll put this in very crude and simplistic terms, is Bucket a good guy or is Bucket a bad guy? He works for Talking Horn, um, but he also at certain times seems to be helpful. And is he something like Talking Horn? That is someone who's interested only in um, doing his job professionally and taking pride in it. There are ways in which Bucket is also a mythological figure in the novel. He's, he's more than just a, a character, a realistic character. Um, he has various magical powers. Um, he has a forefinger that's almost a kind of independent part of his body that is a kind of probe that goes into places and, and finds things. Look, it finds a handkerchief. Oh, this handkerchief has the name Esther Summerson on it. Oh, that must be a clue. Um, uh, at another point, Bucket, uh, when uh, he's engaged by Sir Lester to find Lady Deadlock. Bucket goes up into the high tower of his mind and looks out all over England, looking for where Lady Deadlock can have, uh, may have gone. And as someone who goes up into the high tower of his mind and looks all over England, Bucket has attributes that are very much like an omniscient narrator. <laughs> He's almost a figure of transcendent power in the way that the narrator of the other section of the novel, remember the Bleak House has two narrators. It has one uh, who is Esther Somerson, who is a first person narrator and another impersonal narrator, the roving narrator, the third person narrator. When Bucket first appears in the novel in the chapter called Mr. Bucket from which I quoted earlier, um, he's not in the room, and then suddenly he's in the room. He doesn't walk into the room. It's as if he manifests magically, invisibly, poof, Bucket is in, in the room. So, so I think when you think about Bucket, you need to think of someone who is both um, historically identifiable as a member of the detective police, but also a private detective available for hire. And you also need to think of him as a mythological logical figure. At one point when he um, has identified Hortense uh, as the murderer, he enfolds her in his arms like a homely Jupiter and takes her off stage. So, so there's, there's a, a mythical dimension to, to Bucket. So, so um, the scenes, Buck, Bucket is engaged by Sir Lester. Uh, Sir Lester has a stroke. Um, he, all he can do is write on his slate and he writes fine. And Bucket is able to read Sir Lester's mind. He's, that's another one of his um, novelist powers, novelistic powers, um, is that he can read into the minds of characters with uh, other characters without their having to tell him what they are, are thinking. 
And Buster, uh, not Buster, Bucket uh, then goes and finds Esther. So uh, those passages where they, they, they form for me one of the most magnificent sections of this novel. And um, I, they are exciting. Uh, if, if this novel has been good up through the death of Joe and the death of Talking Horn, it gets even better toward the end. It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, and the writing in that section of the novel is uh, as powerful as anything uh, that I know of in, in literature and anywhere in, in Dickens. So tell me, I, I sort of want to leave that open for, uh, for you to talk about. So what do you think? What, what, is, what is Bucket doing with Esther? What is going on at the end of this novel between Bucket and Esther, much of which is narrated by Esther herself? So, Nina, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, actually, um, I wasn't going to comment on what okay. is like Bucket doing with, uh, or like, you know, Esther, but I actually was going to just comment on like the flipping between the narrators during the whole like chase scene, um, okay. because I actually thought that that was, it was really interesting to have Esther like interspersed in there because um, it kind of helps like retain Bucket's aura of like mystery with his methods and that sort of thing, because she's sort of really out of it and really sleepy and super sleep deprived like the whole time and everything is just like whizzing past her. So I, um, I actually thought that that was kind of uh, kind of interesting because you would get like a lot of action and you would get like, oh my God, like what's going on? Um, <laughs> kind of thing uh, interspersed with that. So, so you were like sort of in the know and then partly not in the know. Um, and, the, and then I actually had another question, which was about like, like him knowing Hortense about like, um, or Hortense's culpability. But mm -hmm. I was wondering if that was actually kind of luck because she just so happens to be his boarder. Is that a little bit like <laughs> fortuitous in like Dickens sense? I, I just, it just like had no backstory in it. So I just thought it was like very uh, mm -hmm. like different, you know, everything seems to be very like causal or connected. And then this one was just like, oh, randomly like Hortense is a lodger. Anyway, mm -hmm. sorry. So that's what I wanted to. I'll, 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 I'll comment on, on, on that. And, and I, I probably should have had tried to finish up the, the murder mystery plot um, uh, because remember that George, uh, excuse me, um, Bucket arrests George initially. Why does he arrest George? Um, and, you know, we don't because think- he knows he's innocent or- Because he knows he's innocent. What's, what, what, what is Bucket's strategy there? But he knows that maybe like George wouldn't put up a fight because on um, like his principles and stuff. So he could just use him as a, um, like a placeholder while he's doing this. <laughs> um, I think there are two reasons why he arrests George. One is uh, a very practical reason that Sir Lester has offered a very large reward and Bucket wants the reward. Um, Dickens wants the money that he gets from publishing the novel. Uh, there's a, a, a monetary benefit that is a principal motive. And Bucket doesn't think that George committed the murder, but just in case George did commit the murder, he wants to be the one to arrest him so he'll get the reward. So that's, that's one part of, of the answer. But I think a deeper uh, strategy that Bucket has in mind by uh, arresting George is that there's another murderer who may reveal himself or herself if the wrong person is arrested. And in this case, he's very correct because Hortense wants to pin the murder on Lady Dedlock. And if the word gets out that, um, uh, that, that uh, George has been arrested and that Bucket has found the murderer, then Hortense's plot of getting revenge on Lady Dedlock is not going to work. So Hortense at that point actually does start sending messages, anonymous notes, uh, writing messages on the wall, Lady Dedlock murderers, um, 
And that's one of the ways that, that Bucket is able to smoke out Hortense and to get her to incriminate herself. And he finally does you know, locate, locate uh, evidence that uh, substantiates that hypothesis. But we could ask the question, and you know, if you've read Murder Mysteries, you know the, the, the classic way that, that uh, murder mysteries get solved by the brilliant detective, which is that there are multiple suspects. And in this case, there are multiple suspects. And the, what finally happens is that the detective brings all the suspects into the library and says, you know, could it be you? Could it be you? Could it be you? And it's a game with the reader. When, when does the, uh, the reader figure out what the detective has already figured out? And suddenly he produces Hortense and Hortense is identified as. But if we think for a minute and sort of keep an open mind, who are the other suspects? And we could, we could even, I'll put this in a provocative way, who killed Tolkienhorn? Or who had reason to kill Tolkienhorn? Who wanted to kill Tolkienhorn? Um, so Phyllis, you've had your hand up for a while and I don't, I, I don't know if you wanted to speak to this because I sort of jumped to something else. Well, I, I would like to just uh, go to something else, um, back to Bucket for a minute. Um, uh, one thing that struck me when there's a, another story that's been being told, right? We had those two allegorical stories, but Bucket's story, the solution and how he um, explains why the women changed clothes at the at the brickmaker's cottage and how they diluted this and how Hortense got to, he becomes Dickens, I think, uh, at, at one point. I mean, he just has this, a story that we, Esther doesn't know that Bucket is, is in control of all that. Um, I agree with you, the chase um, sequence is some of the some wonderful writing. I mean, Pickwick has some great writing too of carriages, <laughs> but this one also, um, it, it, it contains that feeling, that edginess of the, um, he talks about the coming of the railroad, bridges unfinished, the ends like couples not yet united, torrents of rusty carts, tripods where there are rumors of tunnels and not a whisper of a, of a chase. And, you know, the horse-drawn transportation is soon to be gone. Um, so there's, there's this tension going on um, between modernity and, and the 18th century kind of things. And then also it seems like in this last, I'm not sure how many um, numbers, suddenly the, the, the chronology of the narration starts to go back and forth. It, you'll, you'll see Esther said, well, I was asleep while all this was happening. Let me tell you what I was doing when he was doing this. And four or five times I noticed that the beginning of a chapter would be a backtrack from somebody else's point of view or something would go on that they didn't know. It's almost as if the story is going too fast for Dickens to keep up. Of course he is keeping it up, but it, it's it's almost like it's going from a horse-drawn story to a <laughs> locomotive story. A um, Couple of comments on, on what you just said. Uh, Dickens is very aware of the destructive effects of the industrial revolution. This is an ecological novel as, as well. Uh, the coming of the railroad means the destruction, the very violent physical disruption of the old English countryside. This is a movement from uh, uh, an agricultural society to an industrial society. And uh, the Iron Master may in some respects be a more um, attractive figure to be the man of power at that uh, time, but capitalism is destructive in its own way as well. And so I don't think that Dickens is on the side completely of the Iron Master. He's certainly, uh, he's not on the side of the deadlock aristocracy, but as was mentioned by someone previously, I think it was Robert, uh, Sir Lester turns out to be sort of a hero at the end of, of the novel. There are many ways in which Sir Lester is one of the most admirable figures in the novel in his loyalty to Lady Dedlock and his willingness to forgive her no matter what information is revealed um, to him. So uh, the politics of this novel are very complex. There are some ways in which it's an endorsement of, uh, of almost a feudal society 
with Sir Leicester as an example of the, the best of English nobility, uh, the relationship between Sir Leicester and, and soldier George, Mr. George at the end is like uh, the aristocrat and the squire. It's, it's a replication of the very best of, of feudal society, an idealized version of feudal society. We should and George, also, George could be a knight actually on the George, chessboard. George, George would be a knight on, on, on the chessboard. That's, that's a good addition. Um, and uh, the, uh, the chapter in which he meets his brother is called Steel and Iron. Uh, uh, the two brothers, uh, George is steel. What does steel stand for? It's the steel of the, of the sword, uh, the, the knight's uh, weapon. And the, uh, the other brother, the Iron Master, is the Iron Age that is coming uh, and that will destroy the old rural England. So there, there, there are lots of allegories. The, even the name George is a name that goes back to the 18th century and to, and to the, the Georges who were the, the kings of, of England. Um, there, there's a way in which, and George, the name George means farmer. It comes from the Greek and uh, Virgil's Georgic. So there's, there's a kind of um, almost nostalgic dimension to that friendship between George, friendship, vassal, uh, vassalage, patron relationship at the end of the novel um, that uh, um, I, I think Dickens admires. And another figure that we need to figure into that is, golly, so much to talk about, is Boythorn. We haven't mentioned Boythorn at all in, in, in this discussion. Um, what is Boythorn doing in this novel? Boythorn, um, who has the um, bird that sits on his, is it his head or his shoulder? I forget, who's one of the sweet men in, in this novel. Um, Boythorn uh, has a boundary dispute with Sir Lester. And um, uh, it has to do with the right of way. It's a property dispute. and. At the end uh, of the novel, um, Boythorn is prepared to give up his dispute with Sir Lester because Sir Lester is ill and, and, and Sir Lester won't give it up. Sir Lester wants to continue the fight with, with Boythorn. And Boythorn realizes that Sir Lester lives for that boundary dispute, that one of the things that will keep Sir Lester alive and going is to continue the play battle between him and, uh, and Boythorn, which is a, a, a play-like imitation, a harmless imitation of the English Civil War, because uh, that's the fight between uh, the, the, the parliament, the gentry, if you will, uh, the landed aristocracy and the king, the royalty. So they continue, Boythorn and Sir Lester continue the Civil War in a, um, a, an imitation, harmless, play-like form that keeps the past uh, uh, alive and going. But I got off onto <laughs> something there. I really want to get back to, um, uh, to Esther and Bucket and, and the chase scene. And I'll, I'll propose one other way of thinking about that. That comes back to my theme about allegory. Um, so, one of the things that I have suggested previously about Esther is that, and, and you shouldn't take this literally, you need to take this allegorically, if you will, that Esther is dead. Psychically, Esther is dead. She was um, in her fantasy of the moment of her birth. She was buried. She died at that point. And yet she's still alive. And one of the questions that she asks her godmother is, did, did mama die when I was born? So Lady Dedlock is dead uh, from the beginning. And yet she too is still alive. And she's dead in the sense that she, like 
Persephone in, in the myth with, with talking horn uh, spends half of the year in the kingdom of the dead and half of the year uh, in the realm of the living. So Esther is dead and alive. So what's the myth? The myth is that Bucket, and, and it's a different myth from the myth of Persephone, but it's one that has a very similar structure. The myth is the myth of Eurydice, of Orpheus and Eurydice. Esther is, is a figure uh, like Eurydice, who was bitten by a snake and dies and descends into the underworld, into the, the realm of the dead. Orpheus, her lover, seeks her, goes with her into the realm of the dead, and using his song, tries to bring her back to the land of the living. I think that Bucket is the Orpheus figure in this adaptation. Esther is psychically, psychologically dead. She's imprisoned in the, 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 um, the, the belief that she is unworthy. I have a great deal of trouble in trying to write my portion of these pages because I'm not smart. And we've talked about the ways in which Esther is apologetic. She has low self-esteem. Uh, we could use all sorts of modern psychological language in order to describe her. Um, um, but at the same time, Esther has the capacity to be a vital, uh, uh, active, powerful woman. The Esther, who is the queen, the Esther of the Hebrew Bible, the Esther who lies somewhere in her future, if she can overcome the self-doubt, the, the low self-esteem. She's so Esther is psychologically dead. Uh, Bucket is the Orpheus who descends with her into the underworld, the world of the unconscious, the world of, of, of dreams. The chase sequence takes place entirely at night. Um, it takes place in a snowstorm. It takes place, place in, in freezing weather. Uh, Bucket comes to get her in the middle of the night. They go in a closed carriage. Um, uh, Esther looks out the window of the carriage and sees her own face reflected back to her. Um, what, what's going on is, is a search to rescue Esther, as well as a search to find Esther's mother. Um, and um, I, part of what makes this, the writing of this passage so powerful for me is that it is told largely from inside Esther's consciousness, Esther's point of view. And we've said before, this, this has to do with the tenses, the switching of tenses in the novel, that um, one narrator, the third person narrator writes in the present tense and the other narrator, Esther, writes in the past tense. But that's not strictly accurate because Esther alternates or switches back and forth between the present tense and the past tense. And the temporality, the, the sort of time reference of that chase sequence, as, uh, as you were just suggesting, Phyllis, I think, is very disoriented. It's hard to know what time it is. Or who, and, and Esther is going back uh, through her own past, through her own uh, fantasies and through her own worries. Um, she's revisiting scenes from her earlier life. Uh, she's looking for her mother um, because she wants to save and rescue her mother. Um, but she's also, I think, looking for herself. That this is this is a, a psychological quest, and that um, Esther is um, is you know one one way to describe in allegorical terms uh, uh, Esther's journey is not just as a uh, a, a struggle uh, of good and evil or of 
a story of the perseverance of good. It's, it's, it's a story about uh, an individual struggle to overcome the handicaps. And those handicaps are very deep and very complex and very psychological in origin. Um, and um, uh, the bucket is her guide. And I, I even think of, of this it's, it, it, as, as a, I, I think that uh, the, the, the model, if you will, the, another allegory that this novel invokes is, is the process of psychoanalysis, so a, a deep psychotherapy of, of a descent into the conflicts and unconscious fears that an individual has. And the way in which a guide, a therapist, um, uh, if we were to put this in, in 19th century terms, we would need to remember that Dickens was very interested in mesmerism um, and the use of mesmerism to um, help people who had physical ailments that seemed to be psychological in, in, in their component. And people have often said that, uh, that mesmerism and, and that you know we think of it as a pseudoscience that that has no validity, but that mesmerism is is the the way in which the nineteenth century was sort of fumbling its way toward the ideas of Freud and of an of an unconscious, and that someone who was a mesmeric conductor could conduct uh, a person who was suffering from uh, from trauma. I think we could, we could say that Esther is a, is a trauma uh, survivor, um, that, that Esther's trauma is the trauma of maternal abandonment um, and of an upbringing by a godmother who says it would have been better if you had never been born. Uh, again, Esther, Esther is dead psychically, it, it is, is dead. And then once Esther uh, learns who her mother is, her, her mother rejects her again. Her mother says, yes, I'm your mother, but you must ever more henceforth consider me as dead. Um, so Lady Dedlock rejects Esther. Um, and um, there's a passage that I wanna used to try and bolster this argument. And um, Courtney, uh, could you show the, the second um, set of slides? And this is a passage that I, 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 I wanted to, to show uh, to you. It's a, it's a passage um, that comes from uh, the chapter uh, called Covering a Multitude of Sins. And it has an illustration. And we talked about this scene uh, in, I think, our first meeting. And it's, it's, it has an illustration that is a visit at the brickmakers. And you'll recognize the, the figures in this, uh, in this illustration. There's Mrs. Pardiggle sitting in the chair uh, with a, holding a tract, an evangelical tract in her hand that she wants the brickmakers, the working class people to to read. Um, there are Mrs. Pardiggle's uh, sons uh, who are gathered, who are there against their will. It's a very funny seas, uh, uh, passage. Um, uh, the uh, child who's in front of her, even though dressed uh, in skirts, is also a boy um, who's not yet gone into britches. Uh, we see behind Mrs. Pardiggle, Esther in profile, Ada in full face. Uh, outside the door, we see a couple of working class men. Uh, uh, to the right, we see uh, two brickmakers, one man uh, lying on the floor with his uh, uh, head in his uh, hands. And a dog, if you look closely at the dog, you'll see his teeth are bared. He's not, the dog is not happy at this intrusion into uh, the family home. And then in the background, we see the two women, um, uh, one of them doing the washing and hanging it up and the other nursing a child. 
So let me read the passage. Um, so uh, the she in that first sentence is the lady who's doing the washing and she leaves the room. She supposed that we were following her, but as soon as the space was left clear, we approached the woman sitting by the fire to ask if the baby were ill. She only looked at it as it lay on her lap. We had observed before that when she looked at it, she covered her discolored eye with her hand as though she wished to separate any association with noise and violence and ill treatment from the poor little child. Ada, whose gentle heart was moved by its appearance, bent down to touch its little face. As she did so, I saw what happened and drew her back. The child died. And go on to the next slide. Oh, Esther, cried Ada, sinking on her knees beside it. Look here, oh, Esther, my love, the little thing, the suffering, quiet, pretty little thing. I am so sorry for it. I am so sorry for the mother. I never saw a sight so pitiful as this before. Oh, baby, baby. Such compassion, such gentleness as that with which she bent down, weeping and put her hand upon the mother's might have softened any mother's heart that ever beat. The woman at first gazed at her in astonishment and then burst into tears. In the next one. Presently, I took the light burden from her lap, did what I could to make the baby's rest prettier and gentler, laid it on a shelf and covered it with my own handkerchief. We tried to comfort the mother and we whispered to her what our savior said of children. She answered nothing but sat weeping weeping very much. So this happens as early as chapter eight. And there are many things that are interesting and important about this. It's, it's an indication, it's a, the planting of a little plot element that Dickens will use later on, that handkerchief that Esther puts over the, uh, the, the dead baby. Um, and this whole chapter, of course, with its comic elements about Mrs. Pardego, is told by Esther. And one of the things that is interesting to me about it is that Esther does not tell us, Esther as narrator, does not tell us what she is feeling at this point. All she tells us is what she did. I took the light burden, did what I could to make the baby's rest the prettier, gently laid it on a shelf and covered it with my own handkerchief. The emotion in this scene comes from Ada. Can you go back one slide? Um, oh, Esther, look here. Oh, Esther, my love, the little thing, the suffering, quiet, pretty little thing. I'm so sorry for it. I'm so sorry for the mother. I never saw a sight so pitiful as this before. Oh, baby, baby. What is Esther feeling? I think the words that come from Ada are an expression of what Esther is feeling. And that Esther, in her role as narrator, has put those feelings into her doll, that is, that Ada is a kind of doll figure for Esther in her role as narrator. And that Esther here conceals what she is feeling. Um, the key word, the key sentence, um, go back one more slide, please. Uh, uh, the third paragraph. As she did so, as Ada bent down to touch its face, Esther sees what happened and drew her back. The child died. That's a sentence that I think is key to understanding the entire novel. Esther here is witnessing the death of an infant. In symbolic terms, this is Esther witnessing her own death in the form of the death of a child. Her feeling is, that's me. The emotional response 
which is, you know, go forward one slide, please. I'm sorry to be jumping back and forth like this, is Ada's response. Forward one slide, please. Such compassion, such gentleness as that with which she bent down weeping and put her hand upon the mother's might have, I, I need that previous slide, please. Might have softened any mother's heart that ever beat. That's Esther as narrator speaking, and she comments on this scene and says, it might have softened any mother's heart that ever beat. I think she's thinking here, not just of any mother, it's not a generalized thought, but of Lady Dedlock and imagining what she hoped or would have hoped that her mother's response would have been at the moment when Esther died. Ada's response then is both Esther's response, what Esther is feeling here projected onto the Ada character, but also a fantasy of what Esther would have liked her mother's response to have been. But instead, Lady Dedlock's response to Esther, her daughter, is to freeze her out, to reject her again. So maternal abandonment and maternal rejection are something that Esther keeps experiencing, keeps experiencing it from the godmother, experiences it from Mrs. Rachel, the, the servant, and uh, experiences it from uh, Mrs. Jellyby, uh, all of the, the uh, um, unsympathetic mothers uh, who appear in this novel. And the only exception to that is Ada's response here. And this introduces not just the handkerchief motif, but it introduces the confusion that will take place in the chase sequence, where Esther keeps thinking that the person that they are following is the mother of the dead child. The mother of the dead child, whose name is Jenny. She's the woman who in this illustration is doing the washing. So let me move on to um, the next slide, please. And this is, this is the last slide that I have prepared and it's, we, we have about seven minutes left. <laughs> um, the illustration is there, it's uh, entitled The Morning and um, it shows the figure of a woman. Notice that this is a dark slide. Uh, there are two kinds of slides or two kinds of plates that illustrate um, Bleak House. One is our dark slides, fizz, that is Tableau Brown, changed his technique and started using for some of the slides a, a, a technique that produces a very dark slide. Um, this is the graveyard. We can see through the gate, a place where we have been before, where Joe takes Lady Dedlock. This is the graveyard where Hawden Nemo is buried. This is the, the graveyard where Lady Dedlock's lover, the father of her child, is buried. This is um, uh, the, the, a, a figure whose face we can't see. And in this novel, the, the hidden face is, is a recurring motif. Um, so we don't, we know, but we don't know who this figure is. So let me read this and think, of, think about this as a description of a dream. Um, just the, the whole section of the chase. 
is like a dream. I have the most confused impressions of that walk. I recollect that it was neither night nor day, that morning was dawning, but the street lamps were not yet put out, that the sleet was still falling, and that all the ways were deep with it. I recollect a few chilled people passing in the streets. I recollect the wet housetops, the clogged and bursting gutters and water spouts, the mounds of blackened ice and snow over which we passed, the narrowness of the courts by which we went. At the same time, I remember that the poor girl, this is Guster, you remember the Snagsby servant, seemed to be yet telling her story audibly and plainly in my hearing, that I could feel her resting on my arm, that the stained house fronts put on human shapes and looked at me, that great water gates seemed to be opening and closing in my head or in the air, and that the unreal things were more substantial than the real. The, the next slide, please. The passage continues. At last, we stood under a dark and miserable covered way where one lamp was burning over an iron gate and where the morning faintly struggled in. The gate was closed. Beyond it was a burial ground, a dreadful spot in which the night was very slowly stirring, but where I could dimly see heaps of dishonored graves and stones hemmed in by filthy houses with a few dull lights in their windows and on whose walls a thick humidity broke out like a disease. On the step at the gate, drenched in the fearful wet of such a place which oozed and splashed down everywhere, I saw with a cry of pity and horror, a woman lying, Jenny, the mother of the dead child. The next slide, please. I ran forward, but they stopped me. And Mr. Woodcourt entreated me with the greatest earnestness, even with tears before I went up to the figure to listen for an instant to what Mr. Bucket said. I did so as I thought, I did so as I am sure. Miss Summerson, you'll understand me. If you think a moment, they changed clothes at the cottage. They changed clothes at the cottage. I could repeat the words in my mind, and I knew what they meant of themselves, but I attached no meaning to them in any other connection. And one returned, said Mr. Bucket, and one went on, and the one that went on only went a certain way, agreed upon to deceive, and then turned across the country and went home. Think a moment. I could repeat this in my mind too, but I had not the least idea of what it meant. I saw before me lying on the step, the mother of the dead child. She lay there with one arm creeping round a bar of the iron gate and seeming to embrace it. She lay there who had so lately spoken to my mother. She lay there a distressed, unsheltered, senseless creature. She who had brought my mother's letter, who could give me the only clue to where my mother was. She who was to guide us to rescue and save her, whom we had sought so far, would come to this condition by some means connected with my mother that I could not follow and might be passing beyond our reach and help at that moment. She lay there and they stopped me. I saw, but did not comprehend the solemn and compassionate look in Mr. Woodcourt's face. I saw, but did not comprehend his touching the other on the breast to keep him back. I saw him stand uncovered in the bitter air with a reverence for something, but my understanding for all this was gone. I even heard it said between them, shall she go? She had better go. Her hand should be the first to touch her. They have a higher right than ours. I passed on to the gate and stooped down. I lifted the heavy head, put the long, dank hair aside, and turned the face. And it was my mother, cold and dead. And I still can't read this passage without crying. 
Um, and that's the end of the chapter, 59. And it's the end of monthly number 18. All that remains is monthly number 19 and 20, the double monthly number at the end. But it's three o'clock. No, it's four o'clock and it's time for us to stop. So I didn't leave enough time for us to talk about this, but I hope you see some connections between the passage that I just read and the passage about the visit at the Brickmakers. And I hope that next February, the fourth Sunday of February, that we can finish talking about Bleak House, about the ending of the Bleak House, about this chase, and about some issues of narration, what it means for Esther to be the narrator of this sequence of events. So I'm going to say goodbye to you. Thank you. See you. See you. Thank 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 you